All right, so we're wrapping up the book of Haggai here in chapter number two. Just a brief recap what we saw in chapter number one. You know, I kind of gave the, the outline of where this falls in the time of history of everything and, and in biblical history. We're seeing here, this is the second year of Darius. Just a brief recap. The children of Israel, after all the kings, you know, you had the house of David and his sons and they reigned over Judah. You know, Israel was split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And you have all those years of the kings all the way up until they went into captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar came, you know, the Babylonians came, they took him captive, they took him out of their land and brought them into the land of Babylon. So here we are now. They've been in, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has come and gone. King Cyrus was the first king of the Persians that said, okay, you guys can take the things of the Lord's house and rebuild that temple. He's the first one to give that decree to rebuild that temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And, you know, they had a lot of opposition. There was people that didn't want them. That They, would, they didn't want to see the Jews succeed. They just wanted to see them fail. They didn't want that temple built. So they, they had a lot of people kind of confounding their work until ultimately... They, they were forced to cease working and to stop working on the house of God. And they picked up the work again in the, year, in the second year of Darius the king. So Darius is another king that came to power over the kingdom of, of Medium, the Median Persian Empire. And so Darius sets them forth to work in. I'm not going to Last week I went over a lot more in detail what was going on. But basically the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, all of these things are happening at the same time. These all have to do with this time frame when they're going back and rebuilding the temple. And what we saw in chapter 1, uh, the brief synopsis is that, you know, God was telling them that all the work, that because when they stopped doing the work of the Lord, God didn't tell them to stop. They stopped because of the opposition they were facing. But God never said stop doing the work. God had the work laid out for them to do. And so God was cursing them. And he explains in chapter 1 how, look, you kept on trying, you know, you're going out and making money, but you're making money to put in a bag of holes, it says. You know, basically, you're, you're putting your money in, it's coming right back out. He's, he's causing there to be not good yields in their crop. You know, they're, they're not getting as much food as they should. Everything that they do, they're putting in all, all kinds of work and reaping very little. Because God is not blessing their efforts. Because what they didn't do is they didn't put the work of the house of God first. He says, hey, you guys are comfortable. You've got your own houses. You've got everything built. You've got everything going on. And you're going about your business working while my house lies waste. That was the basic summary over chapter 1. That's what we preach on. So Haggai came and he told them, he said, consider your ways. Look, consider what you're doing. Is this right? Is it right that God's house should be laying waste and you guys have, you've got your houses, you've got your house in order, you've got everything going on well in your life, but you don't care about the house of God. So he kind of stirred them up to start working again. And here we are in chapter 2, and this is one month and three weeks later. So chapter 1, you know, uh, he gets the word from God on what to preach unto the people, unto Zerubbabel, unto Joshua, and unto all the people. And he gives them that hard message saying, look, you need to work. You need to work for God. You need to do the things that he has for you to do. Stop worrying about your own business so much and do the work of the Lord. So after a month, almost two months go by, a month and three weeks, Haggai gets another word from God. And it says here in verse number one, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people. So he's speaking to the same people again. Zerubbabel was the governor. He's the one in charge of the things at Jerusalem. Um, Joshua was the high priest. And then, of course, there was still a remnant. There's a, there a residue of people. There's a small amount of people at that time in Jerusalem because most of them were still in captivity. Verse number three. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So what he's asking them is a... Okay, which of you that are here right now remember the old temple? Because remember, the old temple was raised. It was destroyed. When they got taken over, 
the, the temple, Solomon's temple, a temple he built to the Lord. You know, it was real ornate. And when Solomon had it built, I mean, they had, you know, gold plated over the walls. They had all this brass. Everything was really beautiful and, and a lot of expensive things and, and all the, the service of the house of the Lord. Over time, you know, certain kings had kind of sold off. They pawned off some of that in order to, uh, to defend themselves because they had to hire mercenaries to, to help fight for them because their faith wasn't in God. And um, until ultimately when they were taken captive, the temple was destroyed. So he's asking them, do you remember that, that old temple? Who is here that remembers that and in all of its glory? Right? And people, because it was a glorious word. It was, it was, a, it was a magnificent um, sight to behold, that temple. And he's saying, basically, you remember that and now you're looking at the temple that's being rebuilt now? And they're saying it's like nothing. It's nothing compared to the old one. He said, the old one was great, it was magnificent, and now this work that we're doing here, that, is, that it doesn't seem to be adding up, it doesn't seem to be measuring, you know, it, it, it's not even close to as great as that old temple was. But look what he says in verse 4. He says, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. So he's trying to give him some encouragement here. He's saying, look, I know you're looking at this and just thinking to yourself, like, this isn't even close to, what, to as good as the old temple is going to be. So people might start to get that point of what's the point. What's the point? This isn't nearly as good. And, and, and people could get discouraged in that way. And I think about, you know, this church. And I think about building the house of the Lord here. Now, obviously, we're in the New Testament. that We don't have one temple to all go and worship at. We have local churches that we go to. And it's there, they were busy building a physical building. And here we know that the church is a congregation and it's not all about some fancy, ornate, physical building. But what they were doing, it seemed like a smaller thing. But to God, it wasn't. See, they're comparing it to something else, to the former church. You know, they're almost like living in the past. And see, God doesn't want us living in the past. He wants us pushing forward and doing the future. So maybe you came here, you used to go to a church that was this huge church and you know, it's already established and they have all kinds of people. And then you come here and it's like, you know, I remember the church that I came from and it almost seems like this church is never going to get that big because you know, we're in a smaller town. Maybe you live in a big city and there's a big fancy church. And you went to, and there's all kinds of people, and be like, well, this is never going to be like that one was. And God's saying, look, don't worry about that. Don't, don't get discouraged. Like that. Don't keep yourself from the work because you're focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on the past. You're focused on things that you did in the, in the, in the past. You know, that temple that existed, hey, that was great for its time, but that's gone. We need to move on. We need to move forward. We're rebuilding this temple. We're doing a work for God right now. And he says, strengthen yourself and do the work. He says, for I am with you. And I love, I love the message. Don't forget, this is a message straight from God. He's giving it to Haggai. And Haggai goes, and look, he has, he's speaking to individuals. He says in verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, by name. Imagine that, God calling you out by name. Say, O Zerubbabel, you be strong. Joshua, be strong. And all the rest of the people, be strong. There's a message from God saying, look, be strong. Don't let anybody, because they, they had just not been strong. They're just now getting back to work on the house of the Lord. They had been bullied and pushed around, and they stopped doing their work because they weren't strengthened. They weren't strong enough to do it. And now God's saying, look, you be strong because I'm with you. And he's encouraging them. He's building up saying, look, I'm with you. And if you're doing the work of the Lord, guess what? God is with you. And we should be strengthened by that. And as if God is speaking to you directly, be strong. Be strong and do my work. Because it's not going to be easy. Of all people, these people knew that it wasn't easy to be building the house of God, to be rebuilding that temple. They were faced by all kinds of opposition, even to the point to where they made it against the law. He says, I know it's difficult. But strengthen yourself. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Keep your finger here in Agai chapter 2. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 27. Psalm 27. There's an excellent psalm written here in Psalm 27. 
that summarizes this message of being strong and strengthening yourself in the Lord and using God to get your source of your strength and your energy to keep moving forward even though things can be very rough and difficult in a Christian life, especially the more you're doing work for God, the more difficult it becomes and the more it can feel like it's wearing down on you. We go to the Psalms for lots of encouragement and uh, Psalm 27 is excellent. Psalm 27, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is the strength of our entire life. God should be strengthening us. Hey, you're born again. You've got the Holy Ghost residing inside of you. Use that strength of God, of the Holy Ghost, to help get you through. He's saying, what, should I, what, what do I have to be afraid of? I've got God for my strength. God is more powerful than anything and anybody. I don't need to fear what man can do to me. Who am I going to be afraid of when I have God to strengthen me? Verse 2, When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So now he's going to give God a lot of glory here and a lot of credit for things that had happened in his past uh, that, that happened with David. He says, look, when the evil people, these wicked people, my enemies, my foes, they came to destroy me, they stumbled and fell. They came to nothing. David didn't even have to do anything. He's saying, they stumbled and fell. They came to nothing. Why? Because God was protecting him and God was strengthening him. He said, why do I need to be afraid of these people? They may look real scary. They may put up a big show and try to get you to be scared. But if God's protecting you, that's all it is. It's just a big show. And people can be very scary looking and very scary sounding. And they could raise their voice and they could try to get you intimidated. And to start getting you thinking about things. Oh, what could, you know, this can happen and that can happen. You know, what happens to preachers, more often than you realize, you know, people will send death threats and things maybe that they're going to do to their children and things that will make you really start to think like, oh man, you know, what am I going to do? I don't want any of this to happen. And the whole point of, of, of those threats is to get you to stop doing what you're doing. Is to get you to stop the work of the Lord. And God's saying, strengthen yourself. Now, I don't expect anything that drastic necessarily to happen in your life. It's a possibility. Most likely not. But the more work you're doing for God, the more you might be faced and will be faced with something similar. Some other type of opposition. Maybe some family members or some, some, some strangers. Who knows? You know, trying to give you ultimatums. Maybe it might be on the job saying, look, you need to, you need to stop preaching the gospel, you need to stop, you know, working for God or whatever it is or going to that church or else you're going to lose your job. You know, and people come to you with these different consequences. Hey, look, when the wicked are coming to try to, you know, as he says here, to eat up my flesh, God can make it so that they stumble and fall. We need to remain strong. Keep the strength in God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. I mean, imagine, imagine a whole army a whole host, a whole group of people all surrounding you. All wanting to destroy you. That would be a pretty fearful situation to be in. Just surrounded by the, you know, like a foreign army were to come in here and just surround our whole church and be like, they all got their guns pointed at us. He says, I'm not going to be afraid of that. Of all things to be afraid of, you think, oh, I should be afraid of that. He says, My heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He said, What I'm more worried about is dwelling in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That is going to keep you strengthened. That is going to keep you focused on the right thing when you can stay in church, stay in the house of the Lord and behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Verse number five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock 
And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Over and over again, you'll see through the life of David, through the life of many other people in the Bible, God just doing miraculous things to save him. No matter what, against all the odds. In, in, in a situation where you might normally be terrified, you have no reason to fear because God is there to protect you. God is there and, and He makes miracles happen. You remember with Elisha and his servant, they were surrounded by a whole army. Again, it's the same thing. You're surrounded by an army and his servant was afraid. He's like, man, so like, what are we going to do? Well, he's, you know, Look at they're all here. And, he's, and Elisha just was, was calm and comfortable. He's like, God, open up his eyes. Let, let him see and understand. And when he did, he was able to then see the host of angels that God had surrounding them to keep them safe. See, angels are real. They're, they're ministering uh, servants. They're ministering spirits sent by God. We can't behold them with our eyes. But they exist. And the Bible talks a lot about them. I'm not, not a whole lot about them, but enough to know that they're real. And that God can send his legions of, of, of angels to protect people. And when you're walking in the will of God, guess what? If something does happen to you, you could say God allowed it to happen. And we may not always understand why it happens, but we have no reason to fear. So if God allows something to happen, hey, it's within the will of God. We have no reason to be afraid if it's within the will of God. You know, uh, some people are put to death for the, for the cause of Christ. We have no reason to be afraid of that because if God allows that to happen, it's the same attitude that we ought to have that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, right? When they were confronted by Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to throw them into this burning, fiery furnace when they, if they don't bow down to the false god. They had this attitude. They said, look, we know that God's able to protect us. We know that he can deliver us, that there's not, if, if God wants to, he can protect us, and there's nothing you can do about it. And they said, but you know what? Maybe he won't. And if he doesn't, well, guess what? We're not going to bow down to that false god because we're going to serve the Lord. And they weren't afraid. They were fully confident knowing, hey, God's able to save us even now. If God wants to save us, there's nothing you can do to us. If he doesn't, hey, that's fine. That's in God's will. If we're going to be martyred, maybe for some greater cause, something else that we're not aware of, but I don't have to be worried about that because if something bad does happen, hey, I'm going to say it's God's will. He's allowing it to happen. And what did he do? God did deliver them. God did step in. He, they were thrown into this furnace that even the people that were throwing them in, it was so hot, they died. Just getting close enough to it. Yet God made it so that they walked around in the fire not feeling any hurt. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. Nothing. Not a hair of their head was singed. Because God is so powerful and able to keep them from anything. Look, this is the type of faith we need to have and get that type of strength from God. You know, I've, I've heard people sometimes get, get afraid, or not get afraid, but I've heard people comment sometimes to me about uh, when I was going soul winning in Phoenix. You know, we would go to some ghettos, some real bad neighborhoods, places where you wouldn't normally want to just be going, walking around up and down the streets, especially as it's starting to get dark outside. And people say, I can't believe you do that. I mean, isn't that kind of scary? They're like, No. First of all, no, it's not I'm not afraid at all because I know I'm doing the work of the Lord. I know that God is going to be protecting me. If anything's going to happen to me, well, I, when I'm walking in the will of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ unto people, hey, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to fear no evil. As it says in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I shall fear no evil. And... If you're doing what's right, hey, we have no reason to fear. God should be our strength. Let's strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Let's just keep reading. We'll finish up this psalm here. Uh, verse number 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in, in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Even, even when your own family is, is forsaking you, they have nothing to do with you, God won't. He said, God's there. Because, you know, Jesus, God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. 
Verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We need to, to wait on God and trust on Him. And this is what, what God is basically telling them here in Haggai chapter 2. He's saying, look, be strong. I'm with you. I am here with you doing the work. You are doing the right thing. You are walking in my will. This is what I want for you to do. Keep doing it and strengthen yourself. Don't worry about what these other people are going to do, what, what the sand ballots and, and these other guys are going to say and do and try to stop you. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to be thrown into prison. Hey, just do the work that I have laid out for you and, and strengthen yourself. Let's go back to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, we're going to pick up in verse number 5. According to the word that I covenant. So, back in verse 4, he says, For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. He's going all the way back to when they came out of Egypt. He's saying, look, I am with you. I made this promise to you when you came out of Egypt. And we can trust that God is a faithful God that when He makes a promise, even if it's a thousand years ago, He keeps His promise. He, he said, I'm with you. I've been with you since you came out of Egypt. Be strong and do my will. I'm with you. Fear not. He says, fear ye not. And that's a, you know, the only fear that we ought to have is taught in the entire Bible. There's one fear that we ought to have. It's the fear of the Lord. Amen. Any other fear is not of God. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's the power, that's the, the spirit that we give God. It's not the spirit of fear. So when we're, think about that, remember when you're in your life and you get fearful for things, you ought not to be afraid. Identify, learn to identify the fears in your life so that you can overcome them and think about them and be like, you know what, I really don't have to be afraid about this. Now, I don't have to be afraid about feeding my family. I should work hard. I should provide. I should do all the things that I need to do. But at the end of the day, I don't need to be afraid about it. If we have five more children, do you think I could support five more children on my salary? Absolutely not. But I'm not going to cause fear of saying, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I can't do this right now. How, how is this going to work to then rule my decision making? See, I should never be afraid to begin with. I say, you know what? God said they're a blessing. He never tells me not to have kids. So if I get them, God's going to provide a way. I'm going to have faith. No, I'm going to work hard. Believe, you better believe I'm going to work my, my rear end off. But I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to be afraid of it. And we ought not to be afraid of anything. That's just one example. There's all kinds of things that you can become fearful from in your life. We ought not to fear those things. We ought to just be able to do what's right and strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Verse number 6, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. So now he's talking, he's getting a little prophetic here. He's talking about shaking the heavens and the earth. He's talking about the, the kingdom that's going to be and the glory that's going to be in Jerusalem at his house in the end times is what I believe he's referring to here because he's talking about not just the earth shaking but also the heavens. And this is like a cataclysmic event. This happens when, at the return of Jesus Christ and when he comes and sets up his kingdom here on the earth and all nations are going to flow unto Jerusalem and unto the holy city. That's going to happen in the end time. So we see in a lot of these minor prophets, you'll see some, some portions of, of prophecy of uh, future events. And I see that's what we're having here. And he's saying, look, this house is going to be filled with glory. <laughs> Verse number eight, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So he's trying to explain them. You know, they were worried that 
oh man, the other one was so great. This is like nothing in comparison. He's saying, I'm going to make the glory of this one greater than the first one. It's going to be even more magnificent. And, and, you know, in this whole thing, he's encouraging them. Like, do the work. I'm with you. I'm strengthening you. And this house is going to be even more glorious than the last one. And wherever you're at right now, hey, do the work of the Lord. Don't worry about, don't live out of the, out of the past. Maybe in the past you, you did all kinds of work for God. You memorized scripture. You went out. You got a lot of souls saved or whatever. Hey, don't, don't live in the past. And don't just ride off the coattails of things you've done in the past and be focused on that and say, oh, I can never do anything that great again. Keep working harder. Who knows? God can bless you and, and, and completely outshine the work that you had done in the past. Don't ever get stagnant is basically what I'm trying to say here. Don't let yourself just, just say, okay, well, what I've done is enough. God always has work for you to do. When he's done with the work that he has for you to do, he'll take you home. That's when you know that your work here on this earth is done. When he goes and calls you and takes you home. Until then, God's got something for you to do. God doesn't want you just sitting here idle. He doesn't want you wasting your life with, with the, the great gift that you have and whatever gifts God has given you. Everyone has different gifts. God has blessed you, every single one of you, with individual gifts and ways to serve Him. He wants you to use those gifts and, and, and do the work that He has laid out for your life in particular. And every breath that you have, every day that you have on this earth, He wants you to do work for Him. Don't avoid that. Strengthen yourself, the Lord, and don't fear. Let's keep reading here. In, the, in verse number 10, now we're going to hear um, another, there's another break here from that message that he gave unto the children of Israel to just encouraging them to continue to work. Verse number 10, In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priests answered and said, It shall be unclean. So he's asking the priests a question. He says, Ask them a question about the law. He's saying, The law of Moses, here's a question. And what he's saying is, You know, because there, there's a lot of laws about cleanliness. I went over this briefly in other sermons. Uh, about things that are clean and things that are unclean. And when they were in the temple of the Lord, everything was to be holy. So that word holy, it's sanctified, it's set apart, it's clean, it's pure, right? So even the priests, when they went into the holiest of all, they had to change the clothes that they were in to put on holy garments, right? They were not defiled. They didn't get dirty. They weren't outside and they weren't anywhere else. They were specifically for that job so they could be everything about them and they had a, a wash basin. They could make sure they're completely clean when they go in to the holiest of all to do the service of the Lord because God wanted that area to be holy and to be set apart and to be clean, right? So what he's asking them here and he's giving them an example. He's saying, okay, when you have uh, holy flesh, so like an, an, a burned offering, right? And you have this flesh, and it's holy now because it's been sacrificed. And basically, he says, in the skirt of your garment, so you're carrying something around. A skirt's like the lower portion, right? A skirt isn't always what we think of today as a woman's skirt. A skirt of my jacket is the lower portion of my jacket. This is the skirt of my jacket. That's how the, the word is used in the Bible. So when you see that word skirt, you can't, you know, people always try to say, oh yeah, well, Saul wore a skirt, because they'll say David cut off the skirt of his robe when he was in the cave. Yeah, the skirt of his robe. It was a robe. It wasn't a skirt. And people ignorantly will try to use that when, when we talk about how women should dress and men should dress. Men do not wear skirts as we think of it today. When the Bible says Jesus wore skirts, it's the lower portion. So what he's saying is, let's say this pen, because I don't really have anything up here good for example, is a piece of meat that he's referring to. He's saying, okay, you're carrying... And this is holy. This has been sanctified, right? And you're carrying this around. And then he says, if that skirt, if that garment touches something else, you touch this book, it touches this cup, is that going to make these things now clean all of a sudden? Because this, which is holy and clean and pure, just brushed against it and touched it? 
He says, no, of course not. That's not going to make it clean. And then he says, okay, on the same token, let's say somebody is defiled, they're unclean because they've touched a dead body. Right? They're in the Bible says they're supposed to be un they're supposed to wash themselves and be unclean until even. So someone else touches, picks up a dead body, a dead animal, or something like that. They're unclean. Now, if that person starts touching things, now are these things unclean? And the answer is yes. So when something that's defiled and unclean comes in, it's real easy to defile other things. But just because something's pure, it doesn't make other things pure, just by coming into contact with it. When, when you have something that's, that's holy and pure and clean, comes into contact with something that is unclean, then it all becomes unclean, right? And you can think about it, it doesn't even take that much imperfection or impurity. I could, this isn't full right now, but let's just imagine that this cup is full of water, right? And then we go, sorry for being a little graphic, back to the toilet and we take one little eyedropper and drop a drop of the toilet water. Here, who's going to want to take a drink of this? <laughs> Is anyone going to want to take a drink? No, why? Because it's going to be dirt, it's going to be defiled, it's going to be unclean, it's, be, it's gross, it's nasty, right? It doesn't take much. You could have one little, one little piece of something gross or nasty or unclean and you add that to, to something that's totally fine and normal as soon as you add a little bit in or what if we were to go out and just take a little bit of a puddle water what's going to happen you're going to see it go through you'll know, spread throughout the entire clear clean cup of water right that's all it takes and this is what he's teaching you're saying look just a little bit of that unclean you introduce something impure and unholy now all of a sudden the whole thing becomes unholy but you can't just make objects holy just by virtue of coming into contact. They have to be clean and, 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 and cleansed themselves. Right? So this is what he's teaching them. This is, this is what he's getting, this is a point he's getting across. But now he's going to apply this to them. It says in verse 13, then said Haggai, or excuse me, verse 14, then answered Haggai, because they, they answered him. They said, yeah, it's unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. The people have been defiled. The people weren't, you know, they were, they were trying to do what's right, but they were defiled. They weren't doing the right thing. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. There's a few applications that I think that we could make with these verses here. See, they were trying to do a work for God, but they weren't doing it the right way. And they stopped their work, and they didn't have faith. And he's telling them, you know, they're trying to build something that's holy. They're trying to build that temple of the Lord, which is to be holy. But they were unholy. So they're, you know, basically, it's, you know, their, um, their efforts and their works. He's saying, look, this is just like you. The things that you offer, they're unclean. And then he's going to, we're not going to finish up this chapter with, uh, with the rest of what he's teaching there. But, um, this idea of, of being, things being clean and unclean. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in verse number 14. Because we ought to be sanctified with our lives. And see, when you're trying to do what's right and be holy and live a pure and a righteous life for God, as soon as you introduce a little bit of sin, a little, you know, going the wrong way, all of a sudden you become defiled. I mean, for, for a virgin, someone who is virgin... To, it just takes one act with one person, all of a sudden you're defiled. And you can never get back there again, you never get clean again from that, from that one act. Look at, look at verse number 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? They're polar opposites, right? That, those are righteous and those are unrighteous. It's completely opposite. Th that which is good and right and that which is wrong and evil are exact opposites. And what communion hath light with darkness? They don't mix together. Just like what we read here, holy and unholy or defiled things, they don't mix. It all becomes defiled. It all becomes no good. 
He's saying here, look, you shouldn't be yoked together. You shouldn't, you shouldn't yoke yourself together with someone else who's a non a non-believer. And one of the easiest ways to get yoked together, and the best application of this is by getting married to somebody, right? He's saying that what I mean, there's no greater way to yoke yourself to someone than to make a vow that you're never going to leave them. That's a big yoke. Right? There's other ways you can yoke yourself together with people in agreements, maybe in business or something. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's ways that you can really just tie yourself in with somebody and it might not be a good idea. But definitely when it comes to marriage, hey, don't yoke yourself together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness or what communion hath light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And Belial is just the devil. is a false god. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord, God, the Lord Almighty. So what's he say? He said, come out from among, come out from among the filth, come out from among the infidel, come out from among them and be separate than them. Be different than them, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. He said, have nothing to do with that. Now you're different. Hey, before, when you're in the world, before your salvation, you don't know any better. You're in the world. You're dirty. You're dirty from your own sins. You're unclean. But when Christ has washed you, when Christ has regenerated you, when Christ has taken those sins and has washed you white as snow, He's saying, be separate. Don't go back into the mire. Don't go back into the, the filthiness of the world. Don't go back into those old things again. Stay clean. Stay separate. That's why we teach and we preach here a separated lifestyle. Separate from the world. We don't want to be just like the world. Hey, the world's going to lead you to death. It's going to lead you to hell. The world exalts sin. The world, the world has not the knowledge of God. The world is foolish. But we are called to live separate lives. We are called to, to not have anything to do with that. You know, there's, there's some people will suggest, oh, you know, things are okay to get into if it's for the greater good. What I mean by that is, you know, I've, I've heard the teaching that it's okay to go into the bar and sit down and have a drink with your buddy as long as you're going to preach him the gospel, you're ultimately doing the right thing. No. The Bible's teaching us here, be separate from that. Look, don't let the unclean thing come into contact with you. It's going to make you unclean. You don't have to give that guy the gospel at the bar. That's not the only time he should, he's going to listen to you. If he's going to listen to you at all, don't tell me. I, I do not believe that the only way that someone's going to listen to you is if you're sitting down next to them and having a drink with them at the bar. I do not believe that for a second. We talk to people all the time knocking on doors that go out to bars. And, they, and a lot of times they'll listen to us. You don't have to do that in that situation. What it is is people just trying to justify and make an excuse for sin and just say, oh yeah, that's okay. No, we need to be completely separated and, and, and um, not allow anything that defiles to, um, to come in and defile us in our walk with God. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. James chapter number 1. James chapter 1, I love this verse. And see, this is like forgotten. The, just recently, within the past, I don't know, five years or so, the word religion has become like a curse word. It's like, oh, I don't, you know, you, you probably heard this phrase, where, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. Right? You've, you've probably heard that all over. Oh, I don't, I don't have a religion. Oh, no, religion's bad. Oh, I don't like religion. Re you know, I don't like this man-made religion. Yeah, man-made religion is bad. But God-made religion is good. And I'll tell you what, the Bible does have some negative connotations with the word religion, but it's very specific. It's talking about the religion of the Pharisees. Right? That the vain traditions of men and that religion is bad. When, it, when it's something that, that man has just completely created, that is a bad religion. We shouldn't be following that. But when it's what God has created 
it's a good thing. Look at James chapter 1 in uh, verse number 27. We're going to see a use of the word religion in a, positive, in a positive sense. See, people hear this preaching and say, oh man, being separate from the world and, and not you know, going into any type of sin and, and being different than everybody else. You, know, you sound legalist. You sound like something legalist and say, so, you know, you're just teaching religion. Hey, why don't you just teach Christ? Hey, I'm teaching the Bible, and the Bible says to come out from among them and be ye separate. And not to be defiled by the, by the unholy thing. Look at uh, James chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. This is a good thing. Hey, this is the religion that you ought to have. Not all religion's bad. Do I have a relationship with God? Yes, I do. He's my Father and I'm His Son. But guess what? I'm also going to have a religion as well, which is pure and undefiled before God and the Father, which is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, go out and do good things and help these people out that don't have anyone to help them, the fatherless, the widows in their affliction, and, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Pure religion, yes, do the good things and help people out, but also keep yourself from the evil and the wicked and the bad and don't have anything to do with that. You can minister unto people and help people and preach the gospel of God without spotting yourself in the world. Otherwise, he wouldn't say that to do that this way. Keep yourself clean and pure. What you introduce a little bit of leaven, leaven's a whole lump. This is the pure religion and this is what we're striving to do here and this is what I firmly teach and believe that we need to be doing, yes, ministering to the fatherless, minister to the widows, but also let's keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Worldliness. The Bible says that, you know, whosoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The Bible says the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Those are of the world and not of the Father. They're not of God. The lust of the flesh, the things that drive you to sin, the things that, that you get into, the, the whatever, what, you know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the things that you look upon that you ought not to be looking on, and the pride of life. There's so many things uh, that we could go into there that can defile you, but it's of the world. And if you love those things, the Bible says the love of the Father is not in you. And the Bible says that... Uh, that you're the enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world. We're not to be friends with the world. Now we're to go out and try to get the world saved. Right? We're not, we don't just completely disassociate ourselves whatsoever and go, and go pack up and move in a compound somewhere like in Waco and build walls around us and we could all just try to live holy and pure within our little tiny group. No, we are sent to reach the lost and to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. But while we're doing that, we are not to be spotted by the world. We are to be different. We go in the world, but we're not of the world. We do not let those things cleave unto us. That is what we're called to do. One last point on the subject. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 19, the Bible reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Again, another call to get the sin out of your life. Hey, if you name the name of Christ, is he your Savior? Depart from iniquity. Get it out of your life. Don't be spotted by the world. Verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So if you purge yourself from these old sins and, and, and from the, the, um, the iniquity in the world, you will be sanctified. Sanctified means you're set apart. 
holy and meet. It means you're, now you're going to be allowed to be used by God and prepared unto every good work. So in order to do all the good things, we need to be departing from iniquity. God will use you more and more the more you can get yourself out of, uh, out of sin and out of iniquity. Verse 22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's go back to Haggai chapter number 2. So we need to be aware of, of, of being defiled. A little bit of leaven goes a long way. A little, being, being defiled a little bit. I mean, you get into sin, it can bring you down completely. Let's finish up the chapter here. Verse number 15. And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were, when one came to an heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the press fat for to draw out fifty vessels out of, out of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands, yet ye turned not to me, saith the Lord. So now he's kind of going over the similar thing to what he told him in chapter one. When he said to consider your ways, he's saying, look, you went to a heap thinking that you were going to get 20 measures, but there's only 10. You went to the, to the wine press to draw out 50 vessels, but you only got 20. You're expecting to get all this work. Like normally you would be getting this much out of it, but because they were um, not right with God, he made it so that they did not get as much as they normally would get out of all these things. He's saying, I was doing this to you. Do you remember? He's like, look, from the time that the foundation was laid, which was quite a while back because they stopped doing the work. They laid the foundation and then they ended up stopped doing the work. So year, all these years have passed. He says, think about that time. Think about this whole time now that we've been here. You were not being blessed and, and all of your work was coming to very little. You were not getting very much. You were poor. And, he, and he's, he's drawing this to her attention. He's like, think about this. Remember this. And then he asks them here in verse uh, number 18, Consider now, from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Again, he's telling them, to cons you know, consider your ways. Consider what's happened. Consider this whole time frame and what's happened. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. So he's saying, mark this day, pay attention. Because all the way up to this point, I have not been blessing you. And it's been apparent. And you've been trying to work and trying to get things done. And you've been, been focused on building your house. You've been focused on doing all the wrong things. And it has come to nothing. But now, now you've decided to do the work of the Lord. Now I want you to pay attention from this day forward and you'll be able to see that it's God that's blessing you. See, God wants to get all the credit and the glory here too. That it's not just coincidence. It's not just chance. He's telling them before it even happens, he says, think back on everything that's happened up to this point. You have not been blessed at all. You've been working very hard for very little. But now I'm going to bless you. Now, from this day forward, what you do, it's going to prosper. It's going to grow. When you go and, uh, and do this hard work, it is, going to, it is going to yield you fruit. Verse number 20 says, And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And he goes on in this. And I just want to bring up one more point. With, um, you know, when you are worried about doing God's work, Instead of just worried about yourself and all the other things that you have to do in your life, hey, God will bless the other things. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, referring to just your food and clothing and things like that. See, he doesn't want us to be fearful and say, What am I going to eat tomorrow? What am I going to drink? How am I going to clothe myself? He doesn't want us to be worried and concerned about all of those things. God knows we need all of those things. And he's yet, even though we need those things, he's telling us to do something else. He's telling us, Hey, Go out and win souls. Hey, build the house of God. Hey, do the work that I have laid out for you. Don't worry about those other things. I know you need those things. And I'll take care of you. And I'll prove it. And this is what he does. He's, saying, he's kind of showing this to him and saying, prove me now. 
Prove it. I'll prove it to you. If you just would do the work that I'm telling you to do, <laughs> all these problems that you had, trying to make money and trying to make ends meet and everything else, I'm going to take care of that for you. No big deal. You have to have faith, though, and do what I'm telling you to do. God wants our obedience. You say, oh, but I don't have time to go out and knock on doors and give the gospel. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. I have all these other things to do. Hey, are you just putting God on the back burner? Because all the things then, if you do that, consider your ways. Because all the things then that you're trying to do and get accomplished, God's going to blow on that and make sure it comes to nothing. You think you're getting all this extra time. It's like people who think that they can't tithe. Right? Malachi chapter 3 talks about that. He says, prove me with this. All the people that think, well, I'm too poor. I'm barely struggling right now. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I don't see how I could even tithe. How can I even do this? He says here in, uh, in Malachi 3 verse 8, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherewith? Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. He's saying, Prove me. Look, this is what I've told you to do. I want you to obey it. And don't come up with all these excuses why you can't do it because then you're just going to be cursed. He told the people of Malachi, they, they're cursed because they're not bringing their tithe in. He's telling them here, they're cursed. Why? Because they weren't building the house of God. But if we can just trust Him and prove Him, hey, He'll bless us. He said, I, I dare you. He says, basically, I'm, I dare you. Go ahead. Bring in your tithes. You think you're so poor? Bring in the tithes. He's like, I'll pour out a blessing from heaven. You don't have to worry about that. Just do what's right. Hey, you've had all these problems. Now you're doing the work of God? Yeah, we'll see. I'll show you what's going to happen now because I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless all these other things that I know you need because now you're, you're, you're focused on the right thing and what you should be doing and spending your time and devoting time to that I know you don't have all the time in the world to do all, everything all at once. That's why God will bless you in the other areas that aren't as important as doing the work of God. He'll bless you in the areas of being fed and being clothed and the other you know, needs of this world when you just start doing what's right. And we don't have to understand how that's going to happen because God promised it's going to happen. We just have to have faith that He'll do it. And I'll tell you what, to this point, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I have perfect faith by any means, but every time I've ever decided, you know what, no, I'm going to do this, even though I might have all this other stress and all these other problems, and I decide, no, I'm going to spend time working for God, it always, without fail, works out. Every single time I make that decision, every single time, God does not fail. Guaranteed every time. Let's finish up this chapter, uh, verse number 20. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots, and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. No reason to fear even the surrounding nations, he's saying. You know, keep doing the work. It's, this, this whole chapter has been kind of edification and, and strengthening up the, the children of Israel to do this work, and specifically the leaders, right? Zerubbabel and Joshua. He's, he's calling them out and saying, look, don't worry about these, these other nations. Don't worry about these other people. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Verse 23, In that day said the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee saith the Lord of hosts. If you're born again, believer of God, hey, God's chosen you. No, I'm not a Calvinist, but we are, we are chosen. God's wanted, God wants you know, everybody to be saved, and when you've accepted that gift, you are elect. And God has work for you to do. And take comfort and strength in that fact. God has specific gifts. You say, well, I don't know what those gifts are. Hey, keep reading the Bible and trying to do what you think is right in the sight of the Lord. And 
those gifts will probably end up becoming apparent in your life. And um, just get yourself involved in the things that you know for sure are good by God. And then you can, you can realize as time goes on what things you're gifted at if you don't already know. And um, incorporate those into your service to God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the, the, the encouragement that we see here in this chapter. Dear Lord, we thank you for being such a strong God and able to deliver, dear Lord, and, and able to protect us no matter what's going on and able to, to care for us and feed us and provide for us, dear Lord, so that we can be more focused on doing things that you have laid out for us to do than the things that we feel like we need to get done, dear Lord. I pray that you would please continue to guide us, increase our faith, dear Lord, and help us to uh, not be fearful but to only fear you and keep your commandments to you, Lord. I pray that you please help us to strive to have that pure religion which is undefiled where we can be great ministers, helping the, the fatherless and the widows, dear Lord, ministering unto them while at the same time keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.